thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Michael, Michael John. Uh, and thanks all for coming on this uh, cold winter's night. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the winner effect. And I believe it's something that affects everyone in this room, all of us, indeed. Uh, I came to write this book because my first popular science book was called Mind Sculpture. And it was about how our brains are constantly physically shaped and changed by what we do and what happens to us. Um, and then it gradually dawned on me through lovely research that had been done uh, in various parts of the world that actually the biggest source of influence on our brains was actually other people. And one of the greatest features of our relationships with other people are our uh, dominance relationships, our competitive relationships. <clears throat> and uh, so I decided to look at the question in particular of power and of success. So the book is uh, five mysteries. Um, and the first mystery, or the second mystery, is about a fish. It's called the cichlid fish of Lake Tanganyika. And you'll see here two, two of them. The top one is rather dowdy, uh, not very colored, smaller. He's also rather submissive and uh, uh, meek. He's, he's also infertile. He's a male. He's called an NT fish. The one below is a swaggering dandy of a fish, brightly colored, very fertile, very aggressive, very sexually attractive. And um, uh, uh, really, the poor NT fish does all he can to keep out of the way of the, of the tea fish. Now, what's the mystery you may act? Isn't this just a pure example of the survival of the fittest, of the what should be happening, some people have argued in the human race, we don't want the less um, uh, competent or biologically endowed members of the species breeding too much, surely it's much better to, to have this, this, this uh, uh, eugenics, if you like, of Lake Tanganyika. Um, except there's a problem here, and that's the mystery. And here's the mystery. From time to time, over a matter of hours, there's plenty of seats down the front here, for anyone. Over a matter of hours, Mr. NT at the top changes completely in every way into Mr. T. In coloring, in sexual attractiveness, in aggression, and in the size of the gonad neurons in his brain, and he becomes fertile. He becomes a dandy overnight. How does that happen? So bear that mystery in mind when I go through the rest of the talk because I'll come back to it at the end. Now, aren't we born to win? Surely that must be the case given how much attention is paid to who your sons and daughters marry, to the whole question, the dowries which were only recently died out and uh, the West, which are still hugely prevalent in many parts of the world, isn't it the case that really some people are just biologically uh, endowed with features that will make them win? And, of course, that must be to a certain extent true. Hussein Bolt didn't, was born with certain physical characteristics that without which he could not have become the fastest man in the world. So I'm not saying that genetics and talent are not fact features of winning, but I just want to mitigate that assumption to some extent. And I want to talk about the, actually the first mystery in the book, which is the mystery of Picasso's son. Now, this is Paolo Picasso. Um, painted several times by uh, Picasso. Now, Paolo had a very undistinguished life, a very sad life in many ways. His, his own son, Pablito, little Pablo, uh, committed suicide just in the days following his grandfather's death, the funeral. And um, uh, he 
wasn't it? His own family was chaotic, and, and he had a very, he died in his 50s, and really, there couldn't have been a stronger example of someone who should have had a tremendous advantage by virtue of being born son of the greatest artist in the world, but who didn't. So what happened? Mystery of Picasso's son. So here we have the great man himself, uh, who is a, a, my great academic interest these days is aging, and as a man who developed completely new ac artistic styles in his 80s, I, I regard him as a bit of a hero. However, I wouldn't have wanted to be his son. Marie, um, uh, uh, Marina Picasso, his, uh, Paolo's daughter, quotes hearing, overhearing one of a number of conversations. And this is Pablo Picasso talking to his son, Paolo, when he's a, an adult. You're incapable of looking after your children. You're incapable of making a living. You're mediocre and will always be mediocre. You're wasting my time. I am El Rey, the king, and you are my thing. Now, I'm obviously Pab Pablo Picasso was an extreme example, but that's quite a nice example of something which is very important in terms of the success of children of successful parents. And that has to do with a, a somewhat uh, wordy distinction made by the great social psychologist Carol Dweck, who's now in Stanford. And she was interested in what people how people explained to themselves and to others their own abilities. For instance, their intelligence, but also their personality, their social abilities, or their artistic abilities. And she proposed that some people hold entity views of their abilities, whilst others tend to hold more incremental views. What does that mean? Well, let me ask you a question. People have a more or less fixed quota of intelligence and can't change it much. How many of you would say, put up your hand if you would subscribe to that? Or secretly note whether you would or not. <laughs> I was speaking at the Hay Book Festival last week and more than half the audience put up their hands. So this, but Ireland would be a country where this assumption is less strongly held, I believe. Um, People can work to improve their intelligence. How many of you would believe that? Okay, right. So, the secret entity theorists among you who, who didn't put up your hand, you, you, those of you who answered yes to the first question would be tending to believe that your abilities are, I guess, inherited or in some way uh, given to you. They're a thing. Versus those that believe their abilities say their intelligence in this case, is something which is a process of interaction between your effort and the world and your experiences. And this, appeared, this turns out to be a very, very important distinction. Um, so, for instance, children who are entity theorists, who believe that their uh, abilities are uh, something they have, if they're presented with a difficult problem or a problem that they fail on, are much more likely to give up than people, children, who believe their intelligence or their abilities are something, a process, they're incremental. And uh, their brains also respond to being told they're wrong completely different. Entity theorists, uh, supposing they're given a general knowledge test, for instance, they're asked, what is the capital of Australia? And supposing they say Melbourne, um, and you say, no, you're wrong. The entity theorists have a big wave of electrical activity at the front of their brain called the P3A. And it's a kind of, what the hell was that wave? Okay, it's the, the oddball wave. Whereas the incremental theorists have a much less, more dampened response of that kind to being told they're wrong. But more interestingly, if you then say the correct answer is Canberra, the entity theorists show a much smaller 
wave of electrical activity that's linked to memory encoding. The incremental theorists show, oh, I've got that. That's the correct answer. And the entity theorists are less likely to remember the correct answer afterwards. Because, if you think about it, if you believe your intelligence is a thing that you have and you're told you're wrong, what do you conclude from that? You conclude, maybe I'm not smart. Um, the same, uh, the similar evidence with in regard to social relationships. Children who have entity theories about their, um, their person, their social abilities and their personality, if they face social rejection in the school playground, they're more likely to withdraw and hence become more isolated than children who hold an incremental one. So the incrementalists will tend to say things like, uh, uh, God, they were a horrible bunch, I'll try and find some new friends. Whereas the entity theorists are more likely to say, there's something wrong with me. So. The theories that people hold about the origins of their own successes and failures are quite important. So what's this got to do with Pablo Picasso? So what makes a winner? If you think about it, if you think about business people, academics, let's be many people in this room will be successful. I'm reasonably successful, but I, uh, let me tell you what I think the things that contribute to that are. Um, talent, small amount in my case, confidence, a bit more. Practice, yeah, I practice quite a lot. I've worked very hard. I was a bit of a swat. Persisting through failure, yeah, I've done quite a bit of that. And sheer luck. Sheer luck. Most people who achieve great success, it's a balance of these factors. The problem is, when, if you become very successful, there is an awful pitfall. And that pitfall can be a big uh, pit that your children can fall into. And that pitfall is what's called hiding the ladder. And this concept was um, developed by uh, Dr. Fiona Doherty, who's in this audience. And um, she explained this to me only while I was writing this book because she'd said it for many years and I didn't quite understand it, but now I understand it only because of reading this literature. That the effects of su extreme success and power in the brain can so inflate the ego that you become hungry, hungry for adulation, hungry for people's admiration. And there's something mucky. You, you prefer to think of yourself as uniquely talented if you fall into that trap. And so you don't like to see, and you see this, for instance, in some of the, the um, Dragon's Den people in, in the UK. I just think of was one Scottish guy on it. And he really thinks that he is a successful businessman just because of his unique talent wonderfulness. When actual fact, there are e a huge number of people. For every one of him, there's a hundred equally talented business people who didn't make it because of the various uh, vagaries. Or the, not just the right time, the right place, etc. So if you're... Uh, Pablo Picasso, he saw himself as El Rey. John Paul Getty thought he was a reincarnation of Caesar. Uh, it is a feature of success, and I have to say more among men than women, and we can talk about that later, that the, the, the ex effects of success and power are such to inflate their ego sufficiently that they, 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 they present to their offspring an impossible aspiration. If my father is El Rey, the king, incidentally his staff called him the son, how could anyone possibly aspire to being the son? Actually, Paolo Picasso was not a bad scribbler. He was, he, he was actually quite uh, reasonably competent at art, art. But his father, having hidden the ladder, uh, of his success through a kind of super duper entity theory of his abilities, disabled his, his, his son. Now, whether that was a critical feature of the, the, the failure or relative failure of, of, of Paolo's life is a, a different matter, but it's a, an example of what can happen. And <clears throat> certainly in our uh, life, um, 
we can think of examples of the offspring of very successful people who, academics for instance, whose offspring haven't made it, seem to have underachieved given what they would, you would expect for them. And I wonder whether this may play a part in it. And certain research about Princeton graduates, is a surprisingly small number of the offspring of Princeton graduates go to Princeton or an equivalent I believe, I, I believe institution. So let's now talk about power. Um, question for you. Can any of you think of a boss in whom power went to his or her head? Could you put up your hand if you can? Yeah, my eyes are gone, yeah. Okay, take a few seconds to bring them to mind, okay? And, and I want you to then, I'm going to ask you a checklist of characteristics of that person you have in mind, okay? So, uh, was the person pushy? Just put up your hand if pushy would describe them, okay? Selfish? Yeah. Likes having an impact and underlines by shocking them, surprising them, frightening them, or making them grateful. Yeah, yeah. Sees others in terms of their usefulness to them. Yeah. Tunnel vision? Yeah. Sexually primed? Yeah. I was giving this talk to the publishers, um, the, staff in London before the book came out and there was a crowd of people about this size and there was one uh, person at the back, this, this young woman, and she was going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they got to the end and she went, <laughs> 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 um, uh, I'll come on to that in a moment. Are these hypocritical applying different standards to themselves than to others? Yeah. Difficulty in seeing others' points of view? Yeah. Disinhibited, e.g. using Blackberry in one-to-one -one meeting? Um, okay, so incompetent in bullying. So here's the, these are all documented uh, correlates of power. Uh, even small amounts of power experimentally given change behavior in these ways in some people. A particularly potent um, combination is if a boss feels inadequate in their job and have power, there's a much greater chance of them being aggressive and bullying to underlying staff. And given the Peter principle that we tend to be promoted to the level of our incompetence, this is a big problem. Um, but let me ask you about some other characteristics about your boss. Did, did that boss, um, well think, think of us a boss maybe who wasn't negatively affected by power, but just think, can you think of a boss who had strategic vision, seeing the wood better than the trees? Uh, yeah, one or two. Decisive and goal-focused. Yeah. Appetite for risk. Handled stress well. Yeah, good. Smart. Yeah, not all bad for the bosses. Upbeat. Bold and inspiring. Okay, so these are all also consequences of power. Um, power is an antidepressant and an anxiolytic. Um, and it needs, in evolutionary terms, we need our leaders to have an appetite for power and we need them not to be completely broken down by the stress of um, leadership because it's a, leadership is a very stressful business. Um, and so... Also, if you're, you have to have your appetite for risk somewhat dulled or else you would be paralyzed by the inaction of worrying what can happen. So, power, uh, how does all this happen? What's happening in the brain and the body to make this happen? There's um, a few seats down here. People, you're very welcome to come down at the front. Okay. How many of you can, well, what was this event here? Can anyone tell me? Yeah, Giant Staten Stadium, Ray Houghton scores to beat Italy. Um, any of you guess for the, for this one here? Chelsea, Bayern Munich. Now, what I want you to note is this stance of the, who is the Chelsea player? I'm not very good in that, who is that? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. And then look, there we have the stance, one of the Bayern Munich ones there, okay? So now, here we have the next football. Anyone know what this is? 
Roberto Baggio. Uh, this was the World Cup final, Brazil versus Italy, which um, Roberto Baggio missed in the penalty shootout and they, Italy lost. Now, what was very interesting about this study was a group of American psychologists and, uh, took testosterone, took saliva from a group of Brazil fans and a group of Italian fans in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, one in a pizzeria and one in a sports bar, and then did the same after the match. What they found was the testosterone levels of the Brazilian fans went up and the testosterone levels of the Italian fans went down. So just think about that. These were fans. That event engineered the hormones of hundreds of millions of people on the globe, assuming they were fervent football supporters like them. And this, this is why uh, this area of power and winning is, is so fascinating because it is at the interface of social and political life and the life of the brain. And it's critical, I think, to understanding uh, the, 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 the dynamics of essentially mass brain engineering. Um, so winning and power both increase testosterone in men and women. Testosterone in turn upregulates one of the chemical messengers in the brain called dopamine. And dopamine is a critical neurotransmitter in the reward system of the brain. And power and success work through the same circuit that sex and cocaine do. You, f you feel good when you win and you feel good when you have power because the basic primitive reward system of your brain is upregulated. And that's testosterone has, uh, is, is, mediates that effect. Now, have a look there. Just for a moment, a minute, strike a power pose for a moment, would you? Just uh, lounge back, you know, just go on you go. Okay, it's just read. Okay. Because if you remember, if you remember, remember these guys, okay? Remember these guys, look at them. Power is about expansion of space, whereas uh, submission and powerlessness is about constricting space. And in fact, if we go back there, um, if you trick both men and women, if you trick them into striking a power pose, not, they don't think it's anything to do with power, you're just tricking them by, uh, for instance, getting to take this kind of stance by saying, look, we want to look at circulation um, or we're looking at blood pressure that pose will increase testosterone levels. <laughs> so watch yourself going out. <laughs> um, and it will make people feel more bold and more in charge on self-ratings. Um, whereas the opposite is true of constricting ones. And if you think about going for an interview or an assessment, you know, the boss maybe, you know, will, will likely take up more space, whereas the assessee will likely constrict himself. And this is a primitive biological response to dominance. But in terms of tips, if you like, uh, for back regulation into your own brain, faking it is not a bad tip. And that's why teaching our children to hold their head up high, the old adages like, hold your head up high, stand up straight, you know, look them in the eye. If you do that, actually, it will, re it will engineer to a certain extent your biology and your brain. Now, John Coates and Joe Herbert in Cambridge were very interested in the effects of testosterone on risk. And this, was, this study was done just before the delightful crash that we are all suffering from at the moment uh, in London at the Bund, German Bund trading desk. And they studied a group of all male traders and they, every 11 o'clock every morning for about 10 days, they measured their testosterone levels. And then they looked at the profits they made that day. And they found that on the days when their testosterone levels were high, they made more profits. 
And I can't prove this, but I'm pretty certain that uh, the phenomenon of excessive winning and excessive power may have played a part in the scandalous uh, bubble of, of trading and dealing that happened leading up to the big crash. And if you wonder, how, I remember when um, the Ballsbridge site was sold for, and, 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 and the calculation was made that every apartment would have to be sold for a million euro <laughs> in order to recoup the cost of the land. I remember thinking, this is mad, how can this be? And that was true for many, the dogs in the street were thinking that. But how could it be that a small group of people in a key position, how did they not see that? Well, that's because I think the phenomenon of ex excess power and excess success had actually distorted their brain's function via uh, an, uh, an, uh, an increasing focus on essentially greed, but it's called it's a goal focus. It's an appetitive drive towards goals, attention focused on the next thing, and a greatly down-regulated system of the brain that's particularly linked to the right front of the brain called the, the vigilance system. And it's, it's, the, it's the kind of, boy, I'm scared. Oh, I'm wondering if something bad's going to happen. Uh, and it's linked to a different neurotransmitter in the brain. And that system with power tends to get down-regulated. And so you can get this success makes people less and less risk-conscious. Uh, uh, risk so uh, I think that this phenomenon um, is, is, is very, very important uh, in political and economic life as well. But let's come to the real topic of tonight, which is... Uh, the winner effect. Now, uh, Mike Tyson, um, 19th of August, 1995, he just got out of jail, uh, having served three years for rape. And his first fight was against Peter McNeely, Boston Irishman. What happened? Uh, 89 seconds. Uh, William McIlvanny, the great Scottish sports writer, said, McNeely came out like a dervish with a death wish. Second fight was on the 16th of December, 1995, in Philadelphia. It was against Buster Mathis, Jr. What happened? And uh, McIlvanny wrote, Tyson was more likely to be disconcerted by a slap from pendulous breasts than hurt by occasional flurries of feather duster hooks. These were two really uh, staged fights. They were, they, were, they were designed to give Tyson an experience of winning. He then went on to take on Frank Bruno, the then WBC champion, uh, and beat him. And this is a a phenomenon that happens across species, that if you win against a, an artificially weakened opponent, say if you're a mouse and your opponent mouse is sedated and you win that fight, you're more likely to win a subsequent fight against a really tough opponent. Okay, it's called the winner effect. And um, Matthew Fuchsjager in Michigan he showed that winning, and particularly winning at home, <laughs> re-engineers critical parts of the brain so that you become hypersensitive to testosterone. So it doesn't chronically make you pumped up with testosterone. What winning at home, at least in the California mouse, increases receptors for testosterone in critical areas of the brain linked to aggression and to motivation, such that when you are then faced with a fight against a strong opponent, you actually respond uh, more aggressively, but also you're much more motivated to do so and you're more likely to win. That seems to be how the winner effect is mediated. And it seems to be the case that this happens in humans as well, and that's a major factor in explaining the home field, the home advantage in uh, football. 
So you're much more, less, teams are much more likely, almost more, more than twice as likely to win at home than away. And it's not really due to familiarity with the grounds. It's because there's a primitive territoriality that pumps them up and alters their brain function, making them more aggressive and motivated. Um, it happens in offices as well. Try and have the meeting in your own office. <laughs> Study done with business students, and, and people could either, at their own, artificially they were given these tables that quickly became their territory, even in a few, an hour or two. And they were negotiating coffee prices for hotels, uh, simulated. And they compared what prices people got when they were negotiating in their own <laughs> territory versus when they went to someone else's desk. And they got better prices when you were negotiating in your own desk. So this is not just about California mice. And can any of you think of, uh, those of you play sports, it may apply in other areas as well, like bridge or poker. Can any of you think of someone you know who lacks a killer instinct? Who kind of, on the cusp of victory, somehow doesn't get, gives up or, or starts losing? Can anyone put up your hand if you can think of someone like that? Yeah, I'm one. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm superb at tennis and, and uh, not. Um, uh, but, but I don't have the killer instinct, generally. Now, uh, it seems to be the case that we differ in terms of the amount of motivation we have t t for power. It's called the need for power. I won't go into the details of how we measure this or analyze it, but um, you can analyze it reliably from people's language, the degree to which they have a need for, high need for power. Those of us who have a high need for power, and incidentally, teachers and nurses have quite a high need for power, um, as well as um, politicians and policemen. There's maybe different types of power of time and the questions I can go into that. But the main thing is people with a high need for power, if you measure their cortisol, which is the stress hormone, after they win, they show a big surge, I'm sorry, a big drop in cortisol, big drop in, they find winning good. Their stress levels drop. Someone with a low need for power who wins, their cortisol levels go up. They find winning stressful. This was Oliver Schultheis showed this. So I suspect that people, some people have, have more, are more comfortable with dominating, with winning. They have the killer instinct. That's what the killer instinct is, I think. Whereas some people are not that comfortable in dominating. They're, 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 they're uncomfortable with winning. And they, they actually, unconsciously probably, uh, they, they don't finish off their opponent even if they're, 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 they're winning. Now, that's a hypothesis. But let's think about power, need for power some more. Here we have Alistair Campbell and Tony uh, Blair. Now, Tony Blair, according to Steve Dyson at Wabash College, who systematically analyzed the language of Tony Blair's parliamentary questions answers, compared his level of need for power to that of a group of international leaders and he found that Tony Blair was way higher than average for, for international leaders. He had a really big need for power. And that had its good effects. He, he, he made, with a number of other people like Bill Clinton and Bertie Ahern and others, he really pushed through in the Northern Ireland peace process, partly because he had this big need for, for impact. He did very, positive things in Sierra Leone and Kosovo. But then he completely seemed to, to lose the plot with Iraq. And I think that um, uh, he is someone who, had com if you combine a big motivation for power with actual power, because he managed to subvert cabinet um, accountability quite a bit in the way he organized government, I think that combination potentially could explain the, 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 the lack of judgment he, he, he showed when he went into Iraq, but that's, that's speculative and, and is not based on uh, conclusive evidence by any means. If you compare him with Shinzo Abe, Japanese prime minister who suddenly retired, suddenly resigned after a year in office in 2007, 
And it was, he, he stress-related. Um, he couldn't cope with office. Um, these are two extremes, if you like, of uh, the phenomenon of power and leadership and how people res respond to it. Now, Henry Kissinger said, um, power is an aphrodisiac. And if you look at Colonel Gaddafi and his nurse, um, you'll probably understand that, or President Mugabe and his um, young wife. And indeed, um, powerful people have a higher level of sexual, both men and women have a higher level of sexual activity than less powerful people. And that makes sense given that power acts on the same brain circuits as does sex. And so power, um, you know, I'm sure Kissinger, I don't know whether he experienced this personally, but a powerful man like him, no matter how old or grizzled he was, would be attractive to, 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 uh, to women. And um, so we have to see the, the, the ludicrousness of um, the grandiosity of dictators and uh, the complete lack of judgment and narcissism that extreme power seems to, <clears throat> seem, seems to be able to trigger. And some people say, oh, wouldn't it be, we, what we need is a benevolent dictator. And my thesis would be that it's biologically impossible to have a benevolent dictator because unfettered power will unbalance any brain um, uh, to the extent that that person will, will, will start to behave in ways that are harmful to the country he or she leads. Um, so I think that... Uh, the artifacts of democracy, the free elections, um, a free press, and an independent judiciary were inventions, human and clever, clever human inventions, designed largely to counteract the distorting biological effects of power on the brain. Which is why I say thank goodness for Levison, and I look with chilling horror at how a very powerful man who had very few constraints, constitutional or governance constraints in his behavior, like Rupert Murdoch, managed to subvert an entire police force and an entire political system uh, by virtue of his John Major today, the Levison testifying how um, Rupert Murdoch said to him after the 1997 election he would not support him again unless he changed his policy on Europe. Who was Rupert Murdoch, Murdoch to be saying that? And yet he, had, he, he, he could have really uh, more power than many uh, electorates, um, if you like. So that brings us now to the mystery of the cichlid fish. How did Mr. N.T. turn into Mr. T? Well... Lake Tanganyika is kind of shallow and muddy. And one of the downsides of being a brightly colored tea fish is you're more visible to the gulls above. And so you're more likely to be taken. And the tea fish is a territorial fish. That's what the tea comes from. And the tea has territory, but Mr. N.T. does not. But if Mr. T is swallowed, then Mr. N.T. next to him can sometimes take over his territory. If he gets the territory, in less than 24 hours, he becomes a completely transformed fish. <laughs> it, it's, it's like he goes to the gym, he takes steroids, he, he goes to classes for making himself attractive to women, he physically swells, and he becomes brightly colored. And this is purely as a result of a change in his circumstances, his social circumstances. And <clears throat> I think that that applies hugely to all of us, that we are hugely a product, not entirely, but we're hugely a product of the political and social and smaller scale relationships. You get power relationships within families, uh, which shape people's lives hugely. Younger siblings, younger siblings develop a much more acute ability to read the minds of other people, it's called theory of mind, than older siblings do because they have less power. Whereas older siblings, they have less need to be aware of the inner states of their younger siblings because they have control and power. And if you look at the Oscars, um, the mystery of the Oscars, one of the third mysteries in the book, is how is it 
that Oscar winners, compared to Oscar nominees, live an average of four years longer. If that was applied to the whole population that has been calculated, that would be equivalent to curing all cancers. So that's an enormous effect. It's Nobel Prize winners the same. Nobel Prize winners, compared to Nobel nominees, live an average a year and a half longer, which is a huge effect. This is not anything to do with money. That has been excluded as a, a variable here. And there is not a conclusive explanation for this by any means, but my hunch is that if you are a successful per person performing in a competitive world, whether that be the, the film business, theater, journalism, architecture, anything where you're being constantly evaluated, and more and more we're being evaluated publicly, you're only ever as good as your last paper, your last book, your last film. It's very, very stressful. And the greatest stress that human beings can experience is social evaluative stress. That is hugely, hugely stressful. If you get a Nobel Prize or you get an Oscar, it's like you've got nothing more to prove. It's like a big clamp on yourself saying you're there. And no one has measured the cortisol secretion of Nobel Prize winners, but I, my guess is that you have a permanently reduced level of cortisol, which is a, in high doses, very toxic to the body and the brain. It's the stress hormone. I suspect that that's a reasonable hypothesis as why this happened. So anyway, to finish off, um, the, the uh, book's been appearing in a number of formats. This is the American edition. You'll see it's rather nice little trophies in the brain. And this is the Dutch edition, a rather nice little um, laurel wreath. And here's the British one, a cute little tortoise. And, um, and the Germans were the most enthusiastic bidders for the book. And this is their version. <laughs> it's coming out in March. So <laughs> it's very atopical, I think. <laughs> um, so I'd like to say thank you all very much indeed. Uh, for coming, and it's been a great fun talking to you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be glad to take any questions for the next um, five or ten minutes, if anyone has any. There's a few down here, Ian. Uh, yeah, you get Oh, we'll just give you, we'll get you out, we'll get you out. There we go, there we go. You mentioned the difference between men and women. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate? So, um, the, the women show testosterone increases in many, but not all of these experiments. So, for instance, if you get, if you get, contrive to get a man to clench their fist, believing that they're playing rock, paper, scissors, just clenching the fist has produced similar changes to the expansive body, but um, that doesn't happen in women. But more importantly, uh, the need for power is, um, has two forms. One is the ego called P power, and that's the extent to which you are motivated to have impact on other people and control over other people for largely the, the intrinsically uh, ego-driven pleasure of your dominance over them. There's another version of power called S power, which can be, I won't go into the details how you analyze in this language, where you want to have an impact over people, but it's for a greater social good. It's not, now, no one has only one or only the other. Uh, uh, it's, it's usually a mix, but S, S power is, is more prevalent in women than men. They, they are more likely to have a combination of these two. And that, the presence of that S power um, mitigates the uh, testosterone increase uh, that you get from winning. So you get less of a sustained testosterone buzz, if you like, from winning if you have both P power and S power. And um, so my belief is that there should be more women in positions of leadership and, and on boards, et cetera. Um, I'm not, there, are, there are problems that women can have with power that are different from men, so I'm not saying they're angels by any means. Um, there are a whole lot of other factors that come into play, but I think it would make sense to have a, a greater balance of men and women in, 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 in power. Um, but uh, there, is, there is also the, 
the, the question of the priorities and just women w would have to want to, and I, I believe many of them would, want to undergo the stresses that are involved in leadership. You only have to look how Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton have aged over the last two years to see how incredibly stressful holding leadership roles is. And <laughs> it has to be compensated for by that surge in the reward system that power, power has. So, um, uh, so, so, and there, are, there is another hormone called estradiol, which plays a part that's more related to parenting, in, that plays a part in women's biology that men's doesn't, but that's been much less well um, understood and studied. Uh, so, so it's a complex story, and there's no simple answer, but there's a, there are similarities and differences. Uh, we've got someone over here. Oh, yeah, sorry. Hi, um, you mentioned at the start the two beliefs um, that one is that intelligence is genetic and the other yeah. is that it can be improved upon. Um, I think I was the only one who put my hand up for both. Um, <laughs> is, it, <laughs> Good, yeah. is it possible to that talent or intelligence is genetic and that you have yes, to Yes, of course it is. Of course it is. Um, it's, I mean, the, uh, it's impossible to establish heritability levels because it depends entirely on the population. Um, the, the more homogeneous your population is and the more equal the environment is, the greater the proportion will be explained by genetics and the, more, the less um, uh, equal it is in terms of social environmental factors, the, greater, the more will be explained by environmental factors. So, you know, most people end up coming saying it's a 50-50 kind of thing. So I'm certainly not saying there are no genetic factors in success, absolutely not. But um, what, what worries me is even if there are big genetic factors, the psychological consequences of believing that there are um, or, 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 or of, of, of succumbing to what I call the curse of genetic fatalism, they, they, can, have, be, they can be quite, quite tricky. Um, some, someone down here at the front was, uh, there we go, hand up for a while. Yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. It's been most interesting. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the lack, at least the effect of a, a, a non-killer instinct. Yeah. Can you be um, a combination of a winner and an, having a non-killer instinct? I mean, uh, in certain circumstances, yes, there is a killer instinct, and in other circumstances, there, there isn't. Or, or is it, you're a loser? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... I think um, I think the best leaders are leaders who, who, who have a high degree of P and S power. They, you, need to have, you need to have that ego motivation for power, otherwise you won't do it. You, you, why would you go gray and grow old and line so quickly? Um, but you need to be constrained by uh, a, a kind of a higher, uh, a, a kind of feeling of wanting to do good for a greater purpose than just your ego. And in people like that, that killer instinct, that, if you like, that primitive surge of testosterone that comes from dominating and winning is, is, is mitigated, is reduced. It happens, but it does not sustain as long. So I think the best leaders are the ones who are, have that balance of P and S power, and, and they, they, they have a much reduced killer instinct in the sense of getting that raw, kind of rather ugly personal satisfaction of dominance. You know, they, yes, they'll get it a bit, but that's not the game they're in. The game they're in is to get a, 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 a more socially responsible company or a, or a better piece of science or, a, um, or to build a really good team. You know, that's their motivations more authentic. So, so absolutely not the case that it's tooth and claw stuff. In, in fact, I think the, the, the raw killer instinct stuff is probably the, a pretty royal road to, the, to, to, to abuse of power, I suspect. Yeah. Someone behind you there? No, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Could you say you're speaking? There we go. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. That's it. The, uh, for example, the Oscar winner that you described. Yes. Um, surely their motivation doesn't cease when they win. What happens at that point? Yeah. They've reached their peak, let's say. Yes. Um, I, I do. I, I think people people who are high achievers don't stop being high achievers, but what seems 
the hypothesized mechanism, I may be wrong about this, but the hypothesized mechanism for them living longer may be that they can have the satisfaction and the ambition without the raw anxiety and fear of failure and fear of negative evaluation. Because even if they do make a really bad film, they're still an Oscar winner. It's like a, save, it's like a big badge saying you're okay, don't worry anymore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the German title was the one that interested me most. Yes. The uh, Erwald uns verändert, uh, how, how success changes us. Yes. Uh, and uh, the person who comes most to mind is, is Margaret Thatcher. Yes. And where I would be inclined to think we need more uh, women uh, um, in government and at, at board level. Um, does does a f uh, success changes that much, and do we move then from from the S power to the T power when we when we are so successful? Thank you. A very nice question. I mean, um, women are not immune to the to the effects of power, and and the Empress Irene of Byzantium would only have eunuchs in her camp cabinet, um, and I, and I think Margaret Thatcher had she had her way. <laughs> um, um, uh, she, she, found, she found, according to her biography, she found not having power awful. It really was like a drug addict who was, uh, you know, in, in, in cold turkey. She really found it because... Now, she obviously was a unique person. For, for a woman to have managed to get through the Tory party, you needed an, a unique drive. So it wasn't just that power made her, but there was obviously a huge need for for power there combined with the actually having having power but so there, there have been there have been fewer tests you like of what effects power has on women because there have been relatively few women leaders um so whether whether you would get the equivalent to Gaddafi's and Kim Jong-il in in among women that's an interesting question we hopefully we'll see in the next couple of hundred years well that well that that happens yeah <laughs> yeah yeah. Uh, the curse of genetic fatalism. What about when a person has acquired brain injury yeah. and they live in the day yeah. and they go back to their pre, let's say, age 32 memory and they consolidate and they survive with a, a distinct personality change yes. and then the pre prefrontal lobe dementia yeah. and then the creative mind developing yeah. exponentially yeah. when you actually think you have Alzheimer's. Yeah. Do you, I, I know they're talking now about prefrontal lobe and savant syndrome. Yeah. Is that going off? So, so that's an interesting question. Um, even if you have something biologically happen to your brain, like damage to the brain from a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, or even dementia, you can get positive effects of that. And, and Bruce Miller in San Francisco showed a case series of about 20 people who had developed a particular kind of dementia, affecting their, mainly affecting the left half of their brain, all of whom showed a flowering of creativity. Now, that, I'm not saying that'll happen routinely. These were unusual cases he particularly showed. And what seemed to be happening was the left side of the brain being damaged by the disease lifted inhib inhibition from the right side of the brain and therefore allowed uh, previously inhibited processes to manifest themselves some more. I'm not saying that always happens or even usually happens, but it can happen. Thank you. Uh, who's got the microphone? It's a couple of, oh yeah, there and then there, yeah. You mentioned the study that was done about Tony Blair's need for power. Yeah. You said uh, the study looked at the language he used and parliamentary yes. questions. Can you give us some examples of what the study revealed in terms of his language use? Yeah. So, so what you do is you take, you take free text. People have done this about George Bush and Obama. There's a standard ratings where you look at, you, you rate the, um, the uh, language for the degree to which it conveys a need to have impact, to have control the actions of the others, to have an effect on the emotions of others 
and a concern with reputation, a huge concern with reputation. Now, all politicians have these things. It's a question of the degree to which their language is infused with that kind of imagery. And it can be reliably measured. And uh, Tony Blair was particularly high. This was a great political psychologist called Margaret Herman developed this. Um, and uh, he was particularly high on two things, his need for power and his belief that he could control events. Uh, which I think was very much borne out in his belief that somehow he could control what America was doing, that in going into Iraq with them, he could shape American policy, which of course they, they just ignored him really, um, treated him very uh, badly in the end. So that would be an example of the kind of language analysis. So one here and then there's two down here, thanks. Yeah. Hi, um, you mentioned before that when men, for example, cl uh, clench their fists, their testosterone levels go up, yeah. but it doesn't always happen with women. Doesn't, yeah. Is there anything physical that women could do that <laughs> <laughs> might necessarily have the same effect? Uh, power men? posture. Power, yeah. power, power, you know, um, you know if, if you're, yes, the, the, the women showed the effect of the power posture. So if they adopted an expansive posture, as opposed to a, a, a submissive posture, their testosterone levels went up and they, they showed increased ratings of feeling in charge as well. Yeah. Sorry, but is there anything they can do that wouldn't have the same effect necessarily on men? You know. <laughs> I'll, you'll have to think about that. I don't, I don't have, it, I don't no. have, it, I, I have it off the top of my head. I'll, that's a good question. I'm going to thanks, think about thanks. that. Sorry for that. There's two people down here have been asking. Thanks. Um, you know, sometimes, I mean, you see people coming from maybe very kind of deprived backgrounds or like they've had, you know, very little and they are very successful in business. Yeah. So that kind of is nearly the opposite of the winner effect. People are driven by fear. Yeah, this, the winner effect is a statistical mm -hmm. phenomenon, not a, no, it's not determinist. It doesn't, you know, hopefully the winner effect will not apply to Ireland against Spain on Thursday night. There are, you know, you can... We are conscious, sentient human beings, and we can, we can override uh, these kind of forces, if you like, that are acting. We are not subservient to our biology, but we, we have to be aware of the biology. So if, you know, someone who has a high need for power, uh, who's given power, may feel a great buzz from having that power, but it may be that a close relative or a wife or a husband might say to them, look, it's going to your head. And that interchange may help. They have the capacity for, as a human being, for having top-down control or, 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 or ameliorating that to some extent. And that's true for almost anything in human biology, sorry, in human psychology. But it's never 100% it's never determined by some biological force. There's always that interplay of the biology and the psychology. So absolutely. Um, you, you know, it's, it's the great stories of success from people who have come from deprivation or very poor advantage to, to see them, if you like, overcoming that, that disadvantage. Yeah, yeah. And there was one more here. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Um, you were talking about S power and P power. Yeah. Um, and my question is, is there a relationship between intelligence and... Um, you were saying that some people have high levels of S and P, and yeah. is there a relationship between intelligence and how people manage that? I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't think anyone has studied that, but it's a very interesting question. I really don't know. Yeah. Um, how are we doing for time, Ian? Uh, two, more two more questions, right, two more. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, I was just wondering, um, what do you think is going on biologically or psychologically with um, a phenomenon where um, a failure can have a much deeper, long-lasting emotional effect than a success? So someone who gets you know, straight A's and gets one B and is devastated. Yeah. Um, my hunch would be that you, that's more likely to happen to people who have... Um, well, first of all, if they've never experienced failure, the best teacher of the human mind and brain are errors, mistakes. We learn from mistakes. But, and so it's a bit like you get high levels of asthma because children haven't been exposed to bacteria 
in, over clean houses. The immune system doesn't build up a repertoire of responses. The psychological system needs to, to, to experience failure. And if someone has been so protected from failure that they, 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 they go to pieces if they get a B, that's bad, shouldn't be allowed to happen. You know, they should be told that's brilliant, you got a B. That's really, really good. Alternatively, it might be someone who finds that getting a B somehow means that they're not the, the magnificent, unique, wonderful human being that they thought they were. The two of these go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, one more question down here. Thanks. I'm not sure whether this is entirely relevant, but I'm just wondering who is more dangerous, the person with power who is competent or the person who has gained power but is incompetent? <laughs> oh, give me a competent, powerful person any time. <laughs> yeah, I do. I've, in, the, 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 the combination of incompetence and power is truly toxic. Very, very. They're much more likely to be aggressive and bullying, according to Nathaniel Fast and his research. Look, thank you all very much indeed. That was great. Thank you.